Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our third workshop for a cultural competency fair. My name is Iman Bukhari, and I'm a member of the Canadian Cultural Mosaic Foundation. We are a volunteer group working to improve race relations in Canada. This fair is an opportunity uh, to gain insight and to appreciate, interact uh, with different cultures and belief systems that you might not normally have the chance to connect with. And cultural competency actually also includes liter uh, religious literacy as ethnicity, culture and religions intersect quite a bit and take from each other. And that's why we have such an array of topics during this month. This fair is an Alberta Culture Days event and is funded by the Government of Alberta, as well as some public funds generated on our website. So before we begin our event, it's incredibly important that we acknowledge the land that we're on. By acknowledging the land, we are respecting the Indigenous peoples, their contribution and ways of knowing, which are reflected through uh, stories and songs that have lived on this land for thousands and thousands of years. This is, of course, an online event, so we may all be connecting through different places. But nonetheless, I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in southern Alberta, which is where I'm from, uh, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprising of the Siksika, Pigani, and the Ghana First Nations, the Sutina First Nation, and the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley First Nations. The city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. So the workshop that we're about to begin will offer us knowledge and understanding to the origins of yoga, how we can participate in it while respecting the culture and religion. The workshop will be recorded and will be available through Facebook, YouTube, and our website with closed captioning. We encourage everyone listening live to feel free to leave any comments or any questions you'd like to communicate to our guest lecturer with, and we'll get that we'll get to that towards the end. So with that, I would like to introduce our guest lecturer. Sachin Sudra is the founder of Namaste Cooking and a yoga instructor who studied in India. And he's also an Ayurvedic practitioner. Ayurveda is an ancient wisdom and branch of wellness that originated in India and uses specific combinations of spices to help create life balance. Welcome Sachin. Namaste. Thank you Iman for having me. Hey everybody, uh, thanks for coming on, uh, on a beautiful Saturday to listen to a little talk here about decolonizing yoga and appropriation. So I just want to say thanks to Iman once again and the Cultural Mosaic Foundation and of course giving acknowledgement to the First Nations land we're on. First off, I just wanted to say how great it is that yoga is benefiting uh, the world for the whole betterment of mental health and, find, and helps people find balance in their life. Um, my elders have taught me that anything that helps people live in life in more balance and heal is beneficial and good. And as long as it does not damage others around them or themselves, it's okay. The damage really comes from when we lack awareness. So a big thing we're going to talk about here with what decolonizing yoga and appropriation is, is about awareness. And it's really awesome because it can be a pretty heavy, tense topic. People can be like, what are you talking about appropriating colonization and all this? So I've spoken to many of uh, many elders I'm on this topic recently, including yoga studios, yoga teachers, um, studio owners of yoga studios, um, South Asian yoga teachers in India. Also, I've been um, talking with uh, doctors, students, laymen, artists, and First Nation elders. So the first thing I want to do is share with you um, a picture and grace for it for one moment. So right here is an example of what we see in yoga. This is at a yoga studio actually in Toronto, it's in Canada. and. Um, well, I think it speaks for itself. Uh, namaste, bitches. So um, we're taking a sacred term. Namaste itself is a word that is said in respect when we see our elders, uh, in teachers, people, always before and after yoga classes. But when you add on the word bitch to it, what's the term of bitch mean? 
<laughs> or what do we hear the word mean? And it can just be a little bit damaging. Here's one more that I want to show to you. So if I was to show my, or say that to my grandparents, <laughs> I don't think they'd be so happy. We live in a very charged world right now where people are incredibly triggered. And this is also another reason why yoga is so awesome for all of humanity and working as a global unitary movement together to make a difference. But I'm gonna get in the nitty grits first and then we'll move on to some other things. So first off, uh, what is, what's yoga? Like, what, what's the whole deal with this practice? So first of all, why would you want to hit, use yoga, do yoga regardless? And why, what is yoga? So yoga is derived from the Sanskrit word yuj, and yuj is a meaning to join. Yoga is to allow anyone to fully express themselves without judgment and feel comfortable in doing so without judgment. Um, the origins of yoga can be traced, of course, as we know, back to South Asia in India. And uh, it's a space that's been colonized um, for hundreds of years by the British, the Portuguese, um, Spanish. But beyond its utility, yoga has been very popular. And because it's been reinforced in European and Euro-American ideals from India, we see some of these problems and conversations that are coming up on it. Now, the first thing I'll get to is when we look at what yoga is, yoga has rules like anything else. And these rules are based on the eight limbs of yoga. The eight limbs of yoga are called yama, niyama, and asana. Now, these three are meant to remove mental impurities. The fourth is pranayama, as I said before, pardon me. And the fifth is pratarya, which is withdrawing the senses. Um, then we go into dharna, dhyana, and samdhi. Um, dharna is the effort to concentrate. Dhyana is concentration. And samdhi is a state of eternal divinity with consciousness. So it's the highest state that people like to reach. The last three steps are internal, but the asanas, uh, the, the pranayama, these are all externals. So they're meant to strengthen the body and prepare it. I feel with um, BLM, um, things that have been happening in the world with COVID, et cetera, it's a great time to be using for all of humanity uh, practices that are helping us engage and stay more regulated with equanimity around us. Now, there's eight dimensions of wellness as well that exist within yoga. Physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, um, social, professional, financial, and environment. Now, socially, I just want to say, um, how are you allowing people to affect you and your life? So we find this with social media a lot. We'll go on our phones or mobiles. We'll see people and they'll be we'll see posts that they make and it, it charges us in our social environments. So mentally, emotionally, it can have a disassociation to our own selves. And that stems into a spiritual level. It's definitely been talked about by elders that living more of a spiritual life presently is incredibly important, especially for our young people. And one of the reasons it's important for our young people is because this is the generation that will exist when we pass. So just as First Nations do give us the acknowledgement that um, the, the young children and the elders are the wisdom keepers, I feel it's um, our, inte our integrity and very important to recognize that we have to be the caretakers for both of them. And we have a large responsibility as we're living in our cities, we have jobs, and we're communicating with our communities and our relationships and families. Now, these are great techniques, in my opinion, of how yoga helps maintain balance. And if in all of these aspects, in, 
in, in situations help people move forward and where they can make a change. So the question I have to ask myself is even how much am I in balance at times? And that's how yoga really works as a great technique to help us keep balance. So getting in a little bit more into yoga, I wanted to bring up why yoga is important. And here's an awesome book. It's by, you can see this right here. It's, whoop, it's by Dr. Gail Parker and it's restorative yoga and ethnic and race-based trauma, based trauma. She's an amazing woman. She's actually a black woman right here. And this is a woman in America who's doing some great work. So yoga, for instance, had a great deal to offer when it came to easing emotional pain and suffering. And it was brought on, which can be brought on by ethnic and race-based stress and trauma. Yoga practices, particularly restorative yoga, which is more of a calming yoga versus um, goat yoga or power yoga, um, has a lot to offer when dealing with highly charged emotional issues like race and ethnicity. When we practice forms of like restorative, calming, gentle yoga, it really is teaching our nervous systems to how to release a contraction and to feel safe when coming into the deep, deep states of rest that support repair, rejuvenation, and resilience. <clears throat> Pardon me. Now, as it happens, our responses to ethnic and racial offenses become wiser, more functional, and more effective. This is something that we can really importantly see of what's happening in America with the riots, etc. So for me as an individual studying Ayurveda and looking at the response that people have been happening, it's obvious people are angry, they're frustrated, no one's listening to them. So they're speaking out. And then you have other cultures, people in the world who say there's these riots going on. But it really has to do with trauma. And that's why um, this book by Dr. Gail Parker on um, restorative yoga for ethnic and race-based stress and trauma is an excellent read and I'd uh, definitely suggest it to you. If you have any questions, you're welcome to uh, send me a line. I can also be reached at uh, namastecooking.com so you can see what I do. If I can offer any spaces, that will help you relax as well. So the one thing we have to look at, if we're looking at, like, why are people triggered all the time? Like, where does it really come from? And, and as Dr. Gail Parker does speak about is that it really starts at our nervous system. So that's when we get stressed. And again, this is really what yoga was sent out to do over 5,000, 10,000 years ago. And it's the best system to help people in the West. You'll see that we uh, talk about the technical term called mindfulness, it was meditation. So even the word mindfulness kind of straps down what meditation actually is. But when we look at the nervous system in the body and we're stressed, this is a fight response and it has to do with the parasympathetic branch. And this is associated to rest and digest, um, the tend to befriend a response. The two systems alternate to support health and well being and are associated with regulating our immune system and our ability to sleep, relax, and our digestion. So, one of the biggest uh, problems in the Western world or in Europe is people with IBS, uh, digestion issues. These are all things that are internally connected to our nervous system, which indefinitely has to do with stress. So look at how many women are relaxing after they've had a child and just staying home or with men. The testosterone levels may not be regulated. And when, as is said by um, a great uh, Dr. Claudia Welch, Ayurvedic TCM practitioner, when male or female or whichever gender we um, respectfully consider ourselves to be, um, feels a disassociation and stress, be from trauma, racism, violence, their hormones will be imbalanced. So it's incredibly important for men, increase your testosterone, you need that. But we have our female our mothers, find time to relax. We're in a very um, capitalist driven society, which depends on everyone to be go, go, go. And this is where Eastern philosophy comes in so handy because it reminds us to relax, have some island time, you know, <laughs> be easier. There's also something I want to bring up. Um, it's just called the polyvagal theory. And 
the polyvagal vagal theory is to understand how the nervous system works and how there's how the nervous system actually has a state of safety a state of defense and a state of collapse so with the evolution with the nervous system i strongly suggest for um, us to gain more insight into how yoga helps us out we have to always remember that yoga helps calm down our nervous system um, very important one now when we also look at a uh, pain in the body which can be caused from heavy topics like this for example um, i've actually before i did this class i received a lot of uh, flack for doing it even online um, when i posted this uh appropriation thing I'll, I'll explain to you what happened with that but someone left me a rude comment and i'm bringing all this up because words like decolonizing yoga and appropriation are very triggering and it can be triggering because it feels like these words are lashing out at people but they're just terms that are helping educate what has happened in the past and what decolonizing yoga means is it represents a term and practice of not respecting an ancient indigenous practice that was cultivated in a place and then which was capitalized on and commodified. So when we look at decolonizing yoga, we're looking at stripping back the layers and seeing, well, what does it mean to decolonize it and where did it come from? Aruna Dutti Roy said it best when indigenized is this, the Sanskrit word. There are Sanskrit words called from the Gayatri Mantra, which are like mantras such as Namaste. Now these words themselves have become indigenized. And we're always going to be going, we're always going to be people, there are always going to be people who thrive on having more power than others. But this power is inherently being conditioned, not by choice, but by, so, by the social world. And this is by people raised and then whatever values you're taught. So we're living in quite a capitalistic environment. Everyone wants to make money, show off online, show themselves. Of course, entrepreneurialism is what exists and that's good. But when we start to lose the sacredness for certain indigenous practices, we lose really the, the fine thread of what it really is. So what I wish to talk to you about first is what is colonialism? And as we know, colonialism was when we had settlers that came to Asia, North America. Um, they came, they took over indigenous tribes and they commodified off their land, as I said before. So this goes back very deeply, but it also exists within conditioning of how people are raised. So when some people think that one thing might be okay for another, it might not be. And I believe that's why the topic is so heavily charged. And my, my responsibility is to give understanding to people and help us understand what it is so we can have these discussions. Now, so how can we decolonize yoga? Well, I feel some really good points on that are inclusivity. So making it more inclusive, um, access for uh, people who can access them from lower economics in places. So I'm seeing this done in yoga studios where I'm a senior yoga teacher offer um, queer, gender, non-binary yoga classes for a donation. And I'm a very high society, high class yoga studio. So that's allowing more of that inclusiveness into those spaces. Um, respecting the culture, um, be true to the culture and provide accurate information about its history. So I feel this is a really good point for yoga teachers and um, to really look at the historical value of India. Um, support people from the culture. Uh, I've heard this a lot from uh, African Americans and um, people from America that who are yoga teachers who have told me pay people who are helping out marginalize access for people. Educate yourself. Um, if you practice, learn and acknowledge its roots. So these are really big ones and understanding the nuances of their history and, and taking it out of contents and removing it can also be very, very, very hard. 
So decolonizing yoga, again, is a term that represents the practice of not respecting an ancient indigenous practice that was cultivated in a place which has been capitalized on and commodified. So when we look, for instance, uh, at yoga in the West, we can see there are some differences. Um, and the history of yoga in America, well, first of all, Indriya Devi was a Russian woman who brought yoga to America and made it non-threatening for Americans by um, taking out the religious aspects of uh, yoga um, in 1947, which was a big attraction for Hollywood actors. Now, one thing I want to note is that in 1947, that was a partition of India, and that's when Hindus and Muslims separated from each other. In 1965, the American Immigration Act was put into play, and that's when you see a lot of yoga really taking off in America. In the 90s, when, this is the 1990s, when corporations started really happening, and that's when you start to see yoga getting capitalized on. This is when people like Madonna, Sting, Gwyneth Paltrow, Jane Fonda did this to the mainstream. Um, Christy Turlington, who uh, was a supermodel, um, was on the Time magazine for yoga, first of all, and it started blowing up. Now, so is practicing yoga or, a, or a spiritual, so pardon me, let me rephrase that. So is practicing yoga um, a form of appropriation? So the problem that we're facing is that in the 90s is that entrepreneurs and corporations were selling yoga and products as a way to make profit and it reduced it to a mere commodification because among yoga practitioners that's really all they wanted to learn and in yoga magazines there's been less than one percent of south asian contributors which is now changing i want to say um and there's extension of colonialism when corporations advertising companies are mining the culture for their resources and information so this is a big one that we see you know i found it interesting um Lululemon, the owner, actually came up with his name because he thought it was funny how Japanese people said the word Lulu. And uh, this was uh, said to me from, um, was actually an interview from uh, um, Chirag, who's an artist out of New York City, who's been doing some really interesting work on decolonizing yoga too. So if we have people who are billionaires and they're mining so much money from these cultures and making fun of Asian cultures, I, I, I think you start to see how it's apparent. So the takeaways I have to say most definitely are what are they stepping on and what are they buying when participating in yoga? And I think this is a really good point we have to see when we do these practices. So yoga is culturally embedded in India's culture and we see it now surging in a really interesting way. We have different generations coming up. We have social media where things are practiced on, but the true process of yoga is really to be in union with yourself and it's it's really to create peace and harmony. And I really feel that the more we can take time to learn uh, respect from other cultures and, and really find a way to embrace it and, and educate ourselves on where they come from as well. Now, with going back to the word decolonizing yoga, I'm hoping that it's helping out to see how when colonization happened in other countries, such as India, and then when yoga was brought back to the West, Europe, etc., and a lot of the yoga practices, such as Hatha yoga, Ashtanga yoga, there's yoga Nidra, and then we have all our other forms of yoga, such as goat yoga, rage yoga, um, <laughs> the list goes on. But when you take something that is uh, very sacred to help bring, as I said, as Dr. Gail Parker talked about, about calming down the nervous system and allowing someone to heal, it can actually do the opposite. And when you see cultures that feel like it is helping them out, it actually sometimes can do more damage. And this is another reason why when we look at First Nation and Indigenous cultures, I've noticed that they're and I've spoken to an elder about this, that they're very much, they keep their rituals um, a little bit more closed because they don't want to see it being 
appropriated on and used because rituals just like being one with the person you love uh, speaking kind words they're sacred and it, it really comes back to love in my personal opinion and it all does because yoga teaches us that we're as human beings we're all working as a global unitary movement and this is very very important now the one thing with colonization is that this has brought a lot of pain because of what happened in the past. So as um, Dr. Gail Parker um, notes in this book, is that the pain in the body is not personal. It can be collective as well. The collective pain in the body is made up of members of tribes, nations, and races who share their pain in the body by varying degrees of intensity. Members of racial groups who have suffered persecution over centuries are part of a racial body. Now, this is by Toll in 2005. Native people and ethnic groups who were original settlers, settlers of a region before invasion and colonialization, whose populations were decimated and cultures were co-opted and destroyed are examples. Another example is the collective pain of Africans of the diaspora, where whose ancestors were kidnapped from Africa, dehumanized, beaten into submission, and enslaved throughout the Americas and the Caribbean. The suffering inflicted on these populations becomes part of the collective pain of the body of the entire nations because both the perpetrator and the victim suffer the consequences of oppression and brutality. Toll reminds us that because we are all extensions of each other, whatever we do to someone else, we do to ourselves. So this is something that we definitely can see happening right now um, in America and where there's both sides facing each other. In yoga, we talk about a world called ahimsa and ahimsa speaks of nonviolence and that's putting nonviolence onto others and nonviolence onto oneself. So this word ahimsa is really powerful and beautiful because it's a Sanskrit term and it teaches us that. And nonviolence from a small, subtle level. I'll give you an example. He, I went to a store and I bought a hat from a guy, I asked him for hand sanitizer. I said, I really don't want to touch the bottle, you know, because so many people are using it. And he just squirted it in my hand. And um, I could tell he was a little angry, probably. Probably had a really hard day. And I felt it inside my body, but I had to take a check back because there's a subtle response of violence happening within myself. So I really feel, again, yoga really is an impactful and helpful tool for us in all of our world. Meditation, you can call it mindfulness. The main key point is to give, us a, give it some respect. Now, one thing I also want to talk about is yoga again, and Dr. Gail Parker talks about restorative yoga. Awesome. You're relaxing, you're breathing. One thing I do want to bring up is the word shivasana, which is an asana. Now, one um, beautiful, beautiful um, term that was told to me from uh, Ama and uh, Amasu, who is a yoga teacher in uh, London, England. She's a woman who's half black and half white, actually, um, but she's quite visible as a minority. And she's been teaching yoga, but fell into it just because her teacher got sick. But she said a very important thing to me, and that was that when she taught a yoga class, she looked around at the class and said, I'm the caretaker of these people's souls right now. Because when an individual does a shavasana practice, it's you relax, you're calm, and you're, you're allowing your, your, your body to relax. And in the practice of yoga, the teacher has a responsibility, and the responsibility is to take care of their students. It's a very, very big one because in yoga, mental issues, trauma shows up. So being a yoga teacher isn't just about teaching the class and moving on. It's really about seeing how impactful the um, instruction and responsibility is for people who attend. Because we usually find when people are coming to yoga classes, the majorities, everyone has their, um, their stresses but it shows up. So it's a, a very big place to have responsibility. One thing I'd like to say that Dr. Gail Parker talks about is um, restorative yoga. 
um, and the contemplative practices of yoga help mitigate the negative effects and impacts of race-based stress and trauma by offering experiences of feeling relaxed, peaceful, and safe in stillness. It is this experience that deepens our sense of well-being. Now, this is something that we're seeing with uh, yoga in the hood. That's right, yoga in the hood. Um, a really amazing uh, woman named Ebony Smith, um, based in America, is uh, leading uh, programs teaching um, Black Americans, African Americans, so many terms, but Black people from America about doing yoga, meditation for all their communities who are not able to access this yoga practices. And it's amazing because, well, when we think of the two groups that are mainly traumatized in North America, it's um, First Nations, Indigenous peoples, and people, and Black people. And why is that? Well, we have to go back to colonialism. People were decimated from their cultures. And I believe even for myself, as someone who's South Asian, born and raised in Canada, I still haven't experienced that form of trauma in the lineages of my family. So we can talk about epigenetics, how Dr. Gabriel Mateu will bring up of some really amazing information in this. But going back to the one part of that, it all goes back to healing and for all of us, we always have to look at how can we help heal ourselves and then how can we help others around us, but it always starts with ourselves. Um, an example on going back to decolonizing yoga, an example I can give you is I um, am an Ayurvedic practitioner. I uh, actually ended up talking um, for yoga teachers at their studios on Ayurveda. But I was never paid. I was told that I could be offered remuneration, probably some, uh, I'll get some more clients. And I did it because for me, it's just not about money. It's about, um, it's about the traditional and oral practice of uh, serving humanity and sharing what can be very helpful. Now, unfortunately, we can find that capitalism drives many to um, commodify on these. And I, uh, found it after time interesting how I would never get paid for coming and giving two hour lectures where I would have yoga teachers who were doing yoga training courses with several students and they were getting paid quite a bit. Also, I think uh, in terms of yoga and decolonizing it, when we look at inclusivity. So right now I'm doing a yoga teacher training course, advancing myself from India. In Canadian dollars, it's costing me $400 to do a yoga class, the yoga training course. And the system, they actually say, you're not a yoga, doing yoga training, you're a yoga instructor. So if it's $400 to do a yoga training course, the same one in North America would cost me $3,500. So, and those are both online, note. So I feel we need to take um, a path to look at both and see how we can make things more inclusive for more people, because um, these are beautiful practices to help people really relax. Now, one thing I do want to bring up is the word um, colonialism. I'm just going to show you a little image here. So when we talk about colonialism, this is actually um, a picture of hundreds and thousands of bison, buffalo, in um, North America. And this was a great way, well, not a great way, but a bad way that um, when settlers came, they killed all the bison, as many as they could. And now they're coming back, but they basically extincted bison, buffalo from roaming the lands of North America. And this is so the people who were First Nations had no food. They were just living off the land. So these are all skulls actually. And uh, there's a great, um, Nikki Sanchez is a, did, did a really good article on decolonization is for everyone. And this is an example of how when colonialism comes to a country, what can happen, unfortunately. Here's another um, photo for you. This is, um, this is actually from um, Britain, and this is showing uh, some yoga students uh, doing some lovely yoga poses. And you can see on the left, it's more of a White House home, and it's in India, and it was uh, for some, you see a, 
a British Raj there, which is a king, and then some um, some people coming to visit from it's Britain. And it's just showing you how yoga is really compromised just to show for its athleticism, but really not looking into fully the immense beauty surrounding it. So if we go to something like this back in the day, to something like this, <laughs> or something like this, it's cool, but it does take away a little bit of the, the wholeness that comes with it. So going back to decolonizing yoga and what it means. So decolonizing yoga means to take a big step and look at what are the problems and why is, why is this an issue? So the one way I see that we can decolonize yoga in the Western, in the globe is to read some books, do some history, um, research up where it comes from. Um, yoga isn't just about, again, asanas and practices. There are words like namaste. And when they're said correctly, um, like mantras, they're meant to exude a certain energy within the body, which fine tunes it. So we can see this with words like om, for example. Um, and these words are very amazing because they are linked to sacred geometry. They're linked to... Uh, forms of healing. It's very amazing. This is something you can uh, look into in reference from something called the Vastu Shastras. But I'd like to uh, acknowledge also that yoga, once again, is for everyone. But the main thing is looking at it. If you're using yoga to commodify, you have a yoga studio, you're doing it, that's great. The one thing with uh, decolonizing yoga is just to understand the culture, where it stemmed from, what the words are. I'd really suggest looking into um, historical references on it and, and, and also doing what's right for you, using it for how it helps you. It's all knowledge that's meant to help humanity rise more in consciousness and to take us out of our anger. And for that, I think it's a great thing. I, I just feel that we really need to find ways to respect these practices more so they're just not looked at as it's mine. Because in yoga classes, we don't say, now you're doing your practice. Let's all, let's you breathe together. We breathe together. We work together. And the more we tend, we'll do that, the more we'll find that we're more working on a harmonious plane. For myself, I'm uh, working um, with uh, indigenous youth and bringing in Ayurveda into their youth's programs. So I've even asked myself, am I putting, am I somehow being a colonialist in indigenous communities? But I'm respecting the practices there, but I'm bringing in more wisdom and information. And I believe this is a time where we all need to come together and acknowledge and understand that we work together and how can we work together even more? So I think we're going to take some questions and answers in approximately uh, five minutes here. Sorry, just realized I was muted. Thank you so much, Sachin, for talking about uh, decolonizing yoga. Uh, this is so incredibly important. Uh, you know, when we think about yoga in the Western world, what are what are some of the things that we think? We automatically think white woman uh, in in a gym doing yoga, and that's continuously the image that we're sold. Uh, you know, all these studios; those are the images that they put forward. We see it in movies. Um, we, we see a lot of things, and there's a, a lot of history around that. So I really encourage uh, everybody who's watching to please uh, ask any questions. We have such in here who's incredibly knowledgeable uh, in this topic, um, and I. And really just talking about the commodification of yoga. And, and thank you, Sachin, for saying that, you know, it's really about, um, you know, you're supposed to use yoga. Yoga is for, you know, for you to actually use. But how can we do it in a respectful way? How can we respect the culture and respect the tradition and the, and the people and, the, and where it came from? Uh, so we have some folks here just thanking you for uh, addressing this topic. Um, there's Thanks, Megan. We have one comment. Hi, Alyssa. I'm not sure what that oh, means. <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, Thank you, Alyssa. And we have one question here and just talking. Ah, uh, here we go. 
if you can to tell us about how yoga was introduced to the West. And I think it's really way to help people okay. understand this commodification. Sure. Cool. Hi, Kwa Samir. So, well, well, really, if you talk to anybody who knows it, yoga was introduced to the West by Swami Vikananda, the main person who brought yoga to the West. I believe it was in 18... 96 went to Chicago and that's where it started from and then when yoga got introduced it kind of manifolded out from yeah sure places like Hollywood we saw like Patabi Joyce etc like big put names in the game Iyengar came and these were some of the forefathers and this Ashtanga yoga and actually Ashtanga yoga is awesome because it was one that really works well for a western um, mind and body intense poses and it worked with all the limbs of yoga as well which was great because then it also incorporated the whole spiritual aspect so it's bringing balance and equanimity i hope that answers your question let me know if it didn't okay and you sorry you just touched up on um poses a, a little bit yoga poses so do you know the history around it like are those originally from india or was that like kind of combined western names like the downward dog for example and all these different yeah yeah sure Definitely. Now, if we think about it, um, it's like a, if we look at cobra pose, but if you look at the word like pratyarya or sh shivasana, you can't really put those words into English. Like you won't know what they mean. So they, they were really nicely just based that this is a cow pose. This is like, you know, do the downward dog. Just so for the vocabulary of English, it would be understood. But it's always good to remember the traditional names because this, again, is another way to basically kind of wash out what the real terms of yoga were. And that's why it's important to remember these things. And it's very hard when it's not from your culture. The words sound different. But it's also a really important part because when we tend to dilute things that are sacred, then we tend to wash them out. Exactly. Perfect. And that's exactly why we do a land acknowledgement as well to continuously remind ourselves because a lot of us forget or a lot of us don't even know. Thank you so much, Sachin. And other folks are thanking you. Oh, hi, Gail McKenzie. Thank you. Namaste. Uh, so we have one question saying, is there a certain type of yoga practice that helps the collective pain as you reference the patients? Okay. Yes. Donna Twin. I want you to get online right now. Um, I don't like to support Amazon, <laughs> but I did because it's cheaper and I want a budget right now. But check out this book right here. Whoops. Okay. It's called Restorative Yoga for Ethnic and Race-Based Trauma by Dr. Gail Parker. Okay. So that's Dr. Gail Parker, PhD, Restorative Yoga for Ethnic and Race-Based Stress and Trauma. So I'm um, Donna Twin. This is a certain type of yoga, which is called restorative yoga. And it helps with, with, as you referenced, collective pain and reference for First Nations most definitely. Um, you know, one of the reasons why this is awesome is because, um, Donna, you're seeing in the, in the Western world that you're finding black communities who have been damaged just as First Nations, the two big communities, by the way, as we know. And it's an amazing style of rest, restoration. And I just want to say, Donna, if you practice yoga or if you have youngsters, I w one thing I really want to see personally in First Nations reserves and in their communities is more holistic practitioners of Ayurveda, of yoga, of all holistic forms of healing. Of course, not taking away from the cultures, medicine and rhythms, because I just feel like these are such an incredible a way to help out others. There is a, a very nice young woman named Shayla Stonechild uh, on Instagram. You can find her. She's from the Cree, Cree Nation and she's a yoga teacher doing a lot of work with decolonizing and really, really stepping it up as a leader in spiritual wellness. So like I said, Dr. Gail Parker, PhD and restorative yoga is what uh, you want to do. If you have any further questions, you can email me directly. I'm at namastecooking.com or on Facebook. I hope that helps you out. Namaste. And we have one more question asking you, how can yoga help with depression? 
Um, hi, Tahira. So um, I think like it's a, it's, well, first of all, I just want to say when I was bringing up something about um, yoga before, so if how yoga can help out with depression, first of all, is depression usually affects, first of all, like our nervous system and our, um, our, autom our autonomic nervous system. And this is where we have a fight flight response, which is the parasympathetic branch, and it's associated without of the rest and digest. So these two systems alternate to support health and well-being and are associated with regulating our immune system, our ability to sleep, relax, and our digestion. So the function of the autonomic nervous system is to help us survive when you're in danger or you're depressed or, you, um, or you're flourished, and it helps you grow and to be safe. This is how yoga can help with depression. It also acts, uh, Tahira, um, as an internal safety monitor that is always scouting for cues for danger and activity. I'd love for you to look into something, uh, Tahira, it's called the polyvagal theory. That's P-O-L-V-A-G-A-L theory. And this is understanding how the nervous system works and, and how the nervous system, it can be a state of safety, a state of defense, in a state of collapse. Um, as human beings, there's been an evolution in our nervous system and with social media, stress, COVID, unhealthy foods, unregulated environments, not strong family systems, social systems, uh, financially, work. Again, these are all going back to wellness topics with yoga. How do we keep balance in our life? Because if we're stressed out about um, our spaces because we don't feel safe, then we're going to feel stressed. But depression, by the way, in Ayurveda, Tahira, um, it's different from the West. If you're depressed, you're going to take antidepressants. And what does that do? It sedates your mind. So it's not going to save depression. We can go into other places. Interesting enough, that's a pharmaceuticals way of treating this. But when we look holistically, as it said, or in Ayurvedic medical terms, they do practices to awaken your mind. So in yoga, that's what's happening. You're actually awakening your mind instead of sedating it. And well, then we know then that leads to more other lower things. Of course, pharmaceutical medicine, allopathic medicine has its place 100% to help us. But these Eastern and Western divisions of holistic practices for depression are ex exceptionally important. And I'm um, speaking as this is an Ayurvedic practitioner, I wanna suggest that you do speak with a medical certified MD doctor before taking any choices from both. But I definitely wanna say that yoga does definitely help with depression. So um, I, I'd recommend a book by uh, Dr. Gaber Mate on depression, um, holistic practices of yoga, he puts in there too or you can just shoot me a line and I'll shoot you some other books and references for yourself. I really hope that helps out. Nice question. So Donna is just thanking okay. you because it seems Donna found the book. <laughs> awesome, and awesome. Donna found the book, perfect. That's so great. So if anybody has any more questions, we have a few more minutes, so please feel free. I actually have a, have a question for you. Um, and this is kind of like, far-fetched at the moment but uh what would be your like ideal example or world of like how what would be nice if like if yoga was decolonized how would it look essentially in your opinion thanks um <laughs> i believe it's it's really okay how i feel it would look to me was to see an, an, an area of acknowledgement and respect given to the yoga practice, aside from uh, more of just the physical base aspect, because it's a practice that helps liberate human beings. Acknowledgement would be great. You know, that's, that's definitely I have to say. And really, I have to say, just personal inquiry, looking into ways that you can have respect for the place where a culture comes from. You know, an example I can give you would be, um, I went to Lululemon, I had to go return something there today, <laughs> but there was a two hour lineup just to get inside the door. So it shows you how much people are loving the yoga products, etc. But even maybe in those places where they're selling these yoga products because it's specifically what they're used for, 
maybe even in the name tags when you're getting something there can be like a little like pamphlet like hey thanks for buying this lululemon beautiful pants you look great in them but here's like something to do with a sanskrit term um a yoga term in sanskrit and give a little definition around it so someone reading that will be like oh, okay well this is like um, ahimsa non-violence oh that's a cool word and like hey that's cool but at least it's giving a little bit of education on this is to do with non-violence that's one way I think would be cool. Yeah. Because, um, Iman, I don't want to sit here and just uh, tell that, you know, white people, like, colonialism, people of all colors, you're doing the wrong thing, you don't have to respect anything, my culture, blah, blah, because it's not mine, it's everyone's. And that's the true tradition of Hinduism. Uh, and Hinduism is, and yoga is practiced just within the religion because it all equanimizes together to bring a healthy state of mind, body, and spirit. Yeah, thank you so much. And thanks for touching up on that. That's what I was kind of mentioning early on, where cultural competency is actually religious literacy as well, because those things are so inter interwined. Yeah. Uh, we don't have any more questions right now, but audience, we still have 10 more minutes, so feel free. But since we're on the topic of uh, religion anyway, I just thought this would be an excellent time to actually talk about these plots of Sika and also it's, um, like how it's viewed in the Western world. And I know we've had this conversation before, Sachin, and you're so brilliant. So I'd love to, I'd love for the audience to hear about that. <laughs> well, I think that's very kind of you to say, thank you. Well, you know, what, well, when we look at swastika, even swastika, um, a form of appropriation, how colonizers appropriated the symbol of the swastika. Here, if I can show you this, doo -doo -doo -doo. there's a swastika on my hand right there. And it's a tattoo. It's very sacred to me. Um, so the Nazis took the, the Nazi symbol and they kind of turned it a little bit, and it was a very sacred thing. You had pe you had people going into India and looking at Eastern philosophies and incorporating them into their cultures. But the original swastika symbol represents the elements of uh, air, fire, water, earth, and space. It moves in a clockwise manner of Mother Earth's rotation within the galaxies of space and time. Um, and it also is following the uh, the feminine nature of our mothers. So that goes back to Mother Earth, um, the birth. Look at the cycle of uh, a woman's uh, reproductive system for in the moon cycle. It's following the clockwise manner of the moon. Everything's moving together. Um, so in traditional architecture, temple, sculpture, um, um, which comes from the Panishads, and these are um, a form of knowledge bodies called the Shastras. And in um, in ancient scriptures and treaties and a science called the Vastu Shastras of Stapatya Veda, they actually used um, this thing in the West, which we call sacred geometry, which was used as a symbol with mathematical formulas for energy within to create spaces within higher resonance. So having good energy in spaces. So in modern language, we call this sacred geometry. Um, the thing with the swastika symbol is that's used in so many cultures. We see it even in the Edmonton Oilers of Canada, the first women's hockey team. It was used, they were, had swastika jerseys. Um, in uh, Ontario, there was a street called Swastika Road. In uh, Buddhist cultures, um, Tibetan, it's used in, in, in Chinese, in uh, North American. It, it's embedded in the world. In my opinion, it's actually probably extraterrestrial because it's so ancient, but it has such a profound meaning because when you when when people say oh, i got a mandala tattoo or um the flower of life these things all stem back to um a square grid and then they perpetuate outwardly into these really beautiful rhythms so the swastika itself is a representation of that and really of light and love to be honest with you um, if people in, in indigenous cultures, we'll even see, um, or even in my culture I'm from, um, the elements of Mother Earth, the wind, you can see this intercommingling of elements with each other. And that's in a sense of what the swastika is representing. Though it has technical terms as well, I want to add. And if anyone has any interest in that, you're welcome to email me. And that's to do with the Vastu Shastras of Stapatya Veda. Even in yoga, we have swastika asana poses as well. There's even swastika asanas as well. So it's embedded into that those areas too. Um, it's a topic I'd love to get more into, maybe do a talk with you in the future, because I think it would be a really loaded one, triggered, 
But again, when things are triggered, it's really good to see how can we create equanimity in a state of, can we talk about this together instead of just putting on the side? So I'd love to do that more. And uh, thank you so much for having me a part of this a conversation with the uh, Canadian Mosaic Foundation, uh, Iman. Um, I'm very honored yeah, to be here. Sure. Thank, thank you. you. Well, it's really just about having these conversations. If we don't talk, how are we supposed to know? Like the first thing we learn, one of the first things that we learn when we're young and, and born is to learn to talk, to express ourselves, to understand we have this gift, we have this ability, and this is how we learn. So Tahira is just thanking you for your elaborate explanation. And she's hoping that uh, you'll help you. people during this pandemic, for sure. We have one question here saying, lovely presentation, Sachin. What a whole, com what would a whole and complete yoga class look like to you? Okay, so a whole and complete yoga class to me would look like this. Okay, you only have one hour to do yoga or an hour and a half. Janice, I would see it like this. <laughs> First of all, I would see that the teacher is the one who's meditating when the students come in because the teacher, number one, has to be in complete equanimity and balanced in order to hold that space for all those bodies. And I could see from start to end, you know, with breathing, um, maybe some mantras at the end, poses, but it would be different for each class because the teacher would be holding space for everyone in there. So they're like the caretaker again for them. So I think it's always different but there's always, of course, a structured routine that is practice. There is also one excellent yoga studio called the Yoga Institute of India in Mumbai. Uh, they've been around since 1918, and an elder named Hansaji uh, holds the uh, the whole yoga institute. And if anyone's looking to get their yoga training, I strongly suggest um, getting yoga training from there, or even just for yourself. And even that goes for the different kind of yoga practices, Janice would be, does anybody in your yoga class have cardiac issues, hypertension? Are they on their moon cycle? We have to look at all these things because some things that are good for someone in a yoga practice can be damaging for the other. So that's another big thing we really have to account for. Uh, we've seen this in you know, a lot of yoga practices, such as Kundalini yoga, where um, you know, people can come with psychological disorders such as someone had mentioned about depression etc and it can actually if you don't have the right teacher and it hasn't been truthfully acknowledged that i'm coming in with a um some kind of mental disorder etc or sickness or just it can really be damaging for the individual so that's why it's important to feel when you're in an inclusive space that you can be truthful and you can be heard and i feel this is one of the biggest topics we need to talk about too about uh, in yoga we call it satya so about truth and when can we can feel safe in those spaces for truth but we'll talk more about that definitely janice thank you janice is actually has a beautiful yoga page for uh calgary yoga teachers and for the calgary community thank you for um asking the question <laughs>